Today we start in Exodus thirteen seventeen, And it came to pass, when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, Lest peradventure the people repent when they see war, and they return to Egypt. There are people who thrive on conflict. I am not one of them. I say, avoid conflict at all cost. However, neither extreme is profitable. We must always follow where the Holy Spirit leads, and there are times when conflict is necessary. Nevertheless, in Exodus 13, Jehovah said, Not yet. It is not yet time for these people to experience war. In those times that we are unable to press through conflict, we are tempted to turn back to the life we were familiar with. Nonetheless, these people are going to face conflict before they get to the mountain and receive the Torot of Jehovah. Sometimes, when faced with the prospect of a great reward, we will have to fight to be in a position to receive it. As the story of Exodus develops, the children of Israel will be fighting with their eternal archenemy, Amalek. In general, the word meaning for this tribal name is regarded as foreign or unknown. Although sometimes translated as dweller in the valley, there is a Hebrew root, malak, which is used twice specifically for wringing the head off a small bird that will be used as a sacrifice offering. Am Malek, a nation of head ringers, could be a bloody and warlike people committing similar actions upon their enemies. And such a people they were, regardless of whether the etymology is true. The journey of Amalek begins in Genesis 36, where we find that he is the grandson of Esau through the concubine Timnah and Esau's son Eliphaz. Although today we need to be more circumspect about the nature of genetic lines, when it comes to examples in the Tanakh, Jehovah gives very deliberate shadow pictures of the characters involved, of the nature of each human being. Among those, Esau stands out as the material-minded man, lacking an interest for things of the spirit, as it is written in Hebrews 12:16, Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. It even goes so far to say in Malachi 1 and Romans 9:13, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Amalek is not only in the genetic line of Esau, but he is the son of a concubine. He is destined for outcast, rejection, and perennial jealousy. Only through the love and grace of Jehovah can we overcome the biological and spiritual genetics we inherit. The tribe of Amalek makes its first appearance in this fight against the children of Israel. Since leaving Egypt, the people have crossed the Red Sea and seen Pharaoh and his army drowned. They have seen the provision of the cloud by day and the fire by night, the twelve wells of water and the seventy palm trees, of meat and of manna. They have been taught of the Sabbath and seen water come from the rock. They are on the verge of coming to God's holy mountain and now must fight this significant battle. What provokes Amalek to warfare at this time is not mentioned. Perhaps it is a territorial battle. This conflict represents an unusual scenario where as long as Moses can keep his arms raised, the Israelites are winning. But if his arms flag, the Israelites begin to lose. As Aaron and Hur help undergird Moses' arm, a clear picture of how leadership needs support is presented. At the same time, we are shown a picture of the conflict that is sometimes required to place oneself in position to receive what Jehovah is offering. In the end, Israel prevails and they will proceed to Mount Sinai. But Jehovah has given Moses a command concerning the memorial of this day, of this battle, in Exodus 17, 14-16. And Jehovah said to Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar, and called the name of it Jehovah Nisi, for he said, Because Jehovah has sworn that Jehovah will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Elsewhere I have talked about the meaning for Nisi, usually translated as my banner. The Ness is the ensign, the flag over the troops, the place to look in the heat of battle in order to see where to flee if needed. The Ness is also a place of testing and temptation, 
and is related to the root for flee, to run away, as if to a city of refuge. All these concepts are enveloped in Moses' name for this place and altar. Yehovah is my banner. I will leave a link in the episode description to the YouTube teaching on Ness if you want to follow up on that. The place foreshadows Isaiah's prophecy of Messiah in chapter 11, verses 10 through 12. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros and from Cush and from Elam and from Shinar and from Hamath and from the islands of the sea. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations and he shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Even so, the description of the memorial is a bit oxymoronic. On the one hand, Jehovah says he will utterly put the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven, and two verses later, he says that he is sworn to have war with them from generation to generation. It looks like a, I see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. It's a moment from Numbers 24:17. In fact, Balaam affirms the total destruction of Amalek just three verses after this cryptic remark. Yehovah himself also commands the Israelites to never forget Amalek's behavior in the Exodus story. And in Deuteronomy 25:19, it says, Therefore it shall be when Yehovah your God has given you rest from all your enemies round about in the land which Yehovah your God gives you for inheritance to possess it, that you shall blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. You shall not forget it. However, they did not complete this mission. Under a disobedient king named Saul, Yehovah provided the Israelites with a perfect opportunity to accomplish that goal. But Saul was not confident of his authority, and instead of slaying all, as directed, he saved some of the best for himself and the people, under the guise of offering it as a sacrifice to Yehovah. For this sin, Saul loses the kinship over the nation and his family's royal lineage. Samuel takes care of dispatching the king of the Amalekites, but their story does not end here. In spite of the fact that there are no more wars mentioned between them and the Israelites, the thread of the story picks up about four or five hundred years later. In order to track this theme, we need to see the name of the Amalekite king, who thought he had escaped the sting of death under Saul. His name was Agag, or Agag, and despite the fact that he did die, apparently not all of his progeny died, because in the book of Esther there appears a surviving member of the tribe, Haman the Agagite. In Jewish tradition, Haman is considered to be the ultimate enemy of the Jews, representing in every generation those that seek to destroy them. There are many interesting twists and turns in the Esther story, and one of them is that Haman is particularly aggravated with one righteous Jew, Esther's uncle Mordechai, and he is of the tribe of Benjamin, the same as King Saul. Does this not teach us that if you do not deal directly and thoroughly with your problems, that they will come back to haunt you, as it is written in Hebrews 12:15, Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Or how about Deuteronomy 29:18, Lest there should be among you man or woman or family or tribe whose heart turns away this day from Jehovah our God to go and serve the gods of these nations, lest there be among you a root that bears gall or wormwood. Both of these are types of poisonous plants. If you have ever had any sort of garden or even a yard with so much as one dandelion in it, you know how much havoc it can wreak. It need only put on one flower head which goes to seed and instantly plants a whole field of brothers and sisters. Furthermore, you cannot just give it a yank and pull up such a weed. It takes a shovel going down to pull up the whole root. Even the tiniest sliver can cause a whole new plant to grow. So, although it is not always time to go to battle, when the time comes, the battle must be full on and all out. When the Egyptians were drowned at the Red Sea, the victory was complete, and Jehovah told the Israelites they would never see them again. 
This should set the pattern for all such encounters. The enemy is routed and we never see him again.